Okay, so when I left off, we were still talking about equipment problems, and it was kind of talking about, you know, the soda lime and obviously oxygen. Um, vaporizer problems are less common. Um, <clears throat> it can be um, if you accidentally put the wrong agent. Obviously, I remember telling you they are specific, iso, iso, sibo, sibo. Um, if you do accidentally put the wrong agent, um, there is a um, way to empty the vaporizer, except usually it's going to have to be um, cleaned out. You can't just empty it. Um, and then, you know, because in, there's so many internal parts that can be affected. You also don't want to overfill it because, and sometimes it's hard to see the little full line. So just be careful when you're filling it because it can backflow into the internal parts of the vaporizer. So never go above full, uh, that line. And also, if you were to tip it, um, you know, sometimes people are moving them in different places. You hit something, it falls forward. Um, it also has to be serviced because then it'll go, you know, it'll go into the internal parts. So just be careful with the vaporizer. Um, my friend's clinic had a problem with their vaporizer because their room was too cold. Now the vaporizers are supposed to be temperature controlled, but the cold was affecting the setting and the animals were really being light at normal settings. And when they came to look at it, the room was so cold, they think that's what was affecting the vaporizer. So, you know, if anything strange is happening, now sometimes with one patient, it's hard to figure out there's a problem with the vaporizer. But if you're having trouble with patient after patient after patient, um, you may have to look into vaporizers. But most clinics will have usually a servicing agreement with a company that sometimes they come to your clinic and sometimes you have to ship, you can take the vaporizer off and sometimes, and sometimes what they'll do is they'll ship you a vaporizer, a loaner while they're working on your existing vaporizer. So, um, so there's options. And then with the pop-off, um, you know, one of the, one of the common mistakes people do, and unfortunately it definitely can kill a patient, is you leave the pop-off closed. And what tends to happen, and especially when you guys get busy in surgery, is someone, you guys have to go in in the morning and check the machines. If you're in surgery, you have to check the prep room and the OR. If you're dental, you just have one machine to check. But when you go to leak test it, usually you close the pop-off all the way. Now you guys in surgery have that button pop-off that when you ventilate, you usually just push the button and squeeze the bag. But when you check the machine, I usually completely close it to make sure it seals because that button that you push allows for a little escape of gas. It's so it, it'll give you, it'll close it enough to give a breath. But when you go to check for a leak, it's always more accurate to close the pop up. And then usually what happens is some people forget they closed it, they checked it, they go get their drugs, their patient, you go to bring the animal in the OR, forgetting that you left the pop-off closed. So always make sure after leak testing, you open that pop-off. And if your bag is getting way too big, that usually means there's a, a blockage. If your rebreathing bag is getting huge and huge, um, remind me when I see you Thursday, but I'm going to hook up a machine. I, I make like a dummy patient. So you can bag, you can practice. But I show you, you know, if the bag gets wrinkles on the side because it's so tight, that's too full. And a real quick practical tip. Um, this happened to me once. Um, a pop-off got closed and stuck. And we were going to have to get like a wrench and undo it. And the pressure was huge. The fastest thing to do is I disconnected the patient. I took the rebreathing system and disconnected it from the ET tube because there was excess pressure in the machine. And I didn't, you know, if I would have left it hooked up, there was no way to, to get rid of the pressure. And, you know, yes, there was escape of gas, but at that point that could have killed the, <clears throat> killed the patient. So I just disconnected and we rolled in another anesthetic machine and then we had to fix that one. So 
you can do that in an emergency. Um, you know, you can disconnect if you have to. Um, as far as making sure the protocols <clears throat> are good for the patient, make sure you did a good history, and also understanding the drugs you're using. Um, I've told you some key things about the drugs that you're using. I, Dextomator, they, they are bradycardic after that pre-med. Uh, propofol causes apnea, so it's sometimes common for them. You're not using high doses of propofol in your protocol, but sometimes if you give it too fast, it'll cause apnea. And what do you do if they're apneic? So if you give propofol too much or too fast, and they're apneic, what do you do? Wouldn't you want to get them intubated as quickly as possible and get them hooked up to the machine so you can breathe for them? Amen. That's all you can do. Yep. You, you, yep. You, you intubate and you bag because I told you the apnea is usually transient. It usually isn't going to last more than like <clears throat> five minutes or so. So just ventilate them, support them. Um, you have a tube, you have oxygen, you have a bag. Um, and then it should go away. And if you remember, this was a question that I gave you on a test that was like, how do you know if the apnea means they're in respiratory arrest, getting ready to die, going into cardiac arrest, or is this just transient apnea from my drug? Well, you look at your reflexes. I mean, if they're getting ready to die, their eyes are probably central, they're probably pale, they're probably bradycardic, they probably have faint pulses, their jaw tone's probably very excessively loose. I mean, when you induce a dog, they're still gonna have some jaw tone. They're not fully anesthetized yet. So I would expect a dog to still have some jaw tone, maybe still a little bit of a blink. If they have a decent heart rate, if they have good pulses and they're pink, it's probably just apnea from the drug and not impending cardiac arrest. And that's how you tell the difference. You have to look at your other parameters. So that's just something to think about is how do I, diff and, and, and you guys have to be familiar with what do you do? If, if an animal is not breathing or not breathing enough, you ventilate them, you bag them. That's the treatment for that. And one thing that I've told you guys too is normally you breathe once, and I'm kind of using this because I feel like you guys got to really think about this stuff, you know, coming up, is normally one, one breath every three to five minutes is the average recommendation for every patient to prevent atelectasis because they're hypoventilating during anesthesia. It's a normal side effect is they don't breathe as often and deep. Now, if I hook up my patient in surgery and they have a CO2 of like 35 to 45, that's right where I want them to be. You're probably fine just once every three to five minutes. But if your CO2 keep, starts creeping, 50, 55, 60, 65, the excess CO2 typically means they're not breathing enough and you need to bag them. Or for some reason, they're retaining CO2. Now, you can have machine problems, you can have soda line problems that is causing excess CO2, but at the moment, <clears throat> your main goal is to help your patient get rid of it. And the only way you get rid of CO2 is you bag them. And remember, you don't want to go over 20 centimeters of water when you bag them. You don't want to give excess pressure in the lungs. Um, but that's kind of, I use my CO2 to dictate how often I ventilate. That's what helps me determine how many times I'm going to breathe for my patient. Yes, yeah, so that's true. But I, I spend a lot of time talking about high CO2 because that's what you tend to deal with more. But if you go crazy, like so I call it sometimes panic bagging, especially if a dog gets light and you're bagging, bagging, bagging because you're trying to get them back to sleep. And then you look at their CO2 and it's 20. Well, then you've got the opposite problem. You've been a little too 
aggressive and you need to back off ventilation because the only way to build CO2 back up is to not ventilate. And so in that situation, I would probably back off and uh, not ventilate as often. Yes, for CO2, that's all you can do. There's no drug. Um, and, and, and really, it's, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but I've gone several minutes without giving a patient a breath. Sometimes if I have a patient that's been low, I just, it, it'll build up. And because it takes a certain amount of CO2 to trigger a breath. So by backing off, I'm allowing that CO2 to build back up. And you should be able to get the animal back on a regular respiration. So if you guys remember, and especially I know some of you guys work in a clinic and some of you guys are doing this, every day, um, and you're gonna be in surgery, um, is you don't wanna get on this yo-yo respiration because when an animal gets light and they're huffing and puffing, people turn them up, and sometimes you have to, turn up the gas, and they bag a bunch in a row. Well, then what happens is they step back and the patient's not breathing, and then they're like, oh my God, I made them too deep, and they turn them down. More than likely, the reason they're not breathing is because you just bagged them a bunch of times in a row and you got rid of the majority of their CO2. There's no stimulus to breathe. So for all the people that have practical experience, and if you're working with on-the-job trained people, that's the physiology of what you just did. And people don't understand what happens in that scenario. You overbag, you get rid of too much CO2, the patient doesn't breathe. So what do you do? You turn the vaporizer down and you're trying to figure that out. And all of a sudden that CO2 is coming up because they're not breathing. And then they start, they start huffing and puffing again. You're like, oh my gosh, they're light again. Turn them up, bag, 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 bag. Get rid of CO2. They stop breathing. You turn them down. You see what I'm talking about? Yo-yo, you kind of go. So I try to... If they're light, you can help them breathe, but if you overdo it and you get rid of too much CO2 and they don't breathe, and, and this is complicated because at the same time, you do have to make sure you didn't get them too deep. But most of the time in that scenario, you just overventilated and they stop breathing from what Bethany's saying is they don't have CO2, you overdid it, and we have to fix the problem. So if you have the flip side, your CO2 is too low, back off of ventilation. Let CO2 build back up. Metabolically, too much CO2 is more of a problem than too little CO2, but you need enough CO2 to main, also maintain normal respiration in that scenario. Okay. I'm going to just talk about also some of these high risk cases because this is not norm, you know, you maybe in surgery rotation, you're not going to see some of these categories, but you could because we deal with rescues. Um, but one of the ones we have to think about are neonates. And if we're talking about neonates, we're talking about usually less than three months old. If they're like three months old, to you know, maybe six months old, we're talking about pediatrics. Although I would say for me, neonates and pediatrics, I, I kind of treat the same way. Um, one thing we worry about is the pre-op fasting. And if, so if I have a young, and let me give you an example. There's not a lot of times we're doing surgery and anesthesia on a less than three month old animal. I know shelters, We'll do early spaying and neutering. Um, but sometimes they have an umbilical hernia. Sometimes they have an injury that was, you know, they just got adopted and they got their paw stuck under the recliner. I mean, there's probably some scenarios where I could see less than three months old or if they have it like a genetic disorder, um, a PDA. We've done four-month-old uh, 
PDA surgeries, which is the patent ductus arteriosus in their heart. We've done that surgery. Liver shunts, we've done at Purdue. I had young Yorkies for that. So they do come in um, for surgeries, but usually we do not fast them. Um, we usually let them have food all night and sometimes even a little snack in the morning. Um, we don't withhold water um, from them. Usually for their fluids, um, you, we're gonna usually use like a two and a half or 5% dextrose. And remember this key, because um, normally during anesthesia, you wanna do intravenous fluids. You really don't wanna do sub-Q fluids. If you add dextrose to fluids, you cannot give them sub-Q, it will cause tissue sloughing. So don't make that mistake and say, oh, we can't get an IV in this dog because they're too small. I'll just give them dextrose fluid sub-Q. I'm, I'm hoping you were probably taught that, but I want to reinforce that. You cannot give dextrose fluids subcutaneously. Um, you have to give it intravenously because they're hypertonic and they will cause sloughing to the tissues. Um, and then one big thing here, guys, is you can use, well, it says a pediatric fluid pump. Um, usually we'll put them on a syringe pump where we only have a syringe of fluids because they're not gonna get a large amount of fluids. They're usually little. Um, but I'm not gonna hang a liter bag of fluids because if you set the pump wrong, if you remember that case I talked about at Purdue, they set the IV pump wrong. Instead of setting it to 20 mils an hour, they forgot to zero out the nine in front of the 20. So the puppy was set to 920 mils an hour of fluids and they drowned it and it died. Um, now, if they had set the pump wrong and they had used a small bag of fluids, we wouldn't have been in that problem. Usually if I have pediatrics, fluid bags come in 250 mils. I know you guys are used to seeing liter bag and 500 mil bags, but they even make 250 mils. And sometimes you can do, you can use a burette, which is a very small fluid chamber. Um, that's what I recommend. A syringe pump, small amounts of fluids are key. Um, weigh them usually with a gram scale to get adequate weight for your drugs. Um, and the other thing is that they usually have, you know, liver is still developing and the liver produces proteins. So at least try to get a protein level. You may not be doing full blood work, but at least you could do like a PCV, a glucose, get protein because that's what helps drugs bind and fluid therapy. Um, you can use inhalants, but the things that you also have to worry about is they're prone to hypothermia and hypotension and hypoxemia because they're not ventilating adequately. Um, and one thing in pediatrics is their heart rate or their blood pressure is more dependent on their heart rate than an adult animal. Um, so meaning if a pediatric patient or a neonate has bradycardia, their blood pressure tends to drop. In an adult animal, if their heart rate drops, their, their vascular system will try to compensate, will try to vasoconstrict, and there's things called baroreceptors that will try to compensate for the low heart rate. But in a neonate or pediatric, they don't have that mechanism well set up. So I'm very, usually if I have a bradycardic neonate, not from an alpha two, but bradycardia is I will usually give them an anticholinergic to try and bring up their heart rate. And it usually will improve, improve blood pressure and perfusion. Um, I think I told you guys when I had a Yorkie and it got down to 88 degrees during surgery. We were doing a liver shunt. It's very hard to keep these patients warm. 88 degrees is pretty darn cold. But the puppy had like a heart rate of 60, which for a Yorkie puppy is extremely low. And I had given atropine with no response. I gave a second dose of atropine, no response. I gave three doses of atropine. And I was working with my anesthesiologist and I'm just like, I've given this dog 
three doses of atropine. And he's like, it's because the dog is so hypothermic, the body's going into preservation mode. Like when people can survive being submerged in a icy pond is that the brain kind of takes over and it's protective. So once we started getting the puppy warm, the atropine kicked in, the heart rate came up, but it was very nail bitey for quite a few moments. Um, the other thing I want to mention, uh, geriatrics on the flip side, I will make this statement and it's 100% true, age is not a disease. Um, and you will have a lot of clients that don't want to do a dental or they don't want to do this because their dog is old. Um, I anesthetized a 17 year old shepherd husky mix with a brain tumor 21 times because brain radiation, um, we had to do that many treatments. That dog did better during anesthesia than some of my middle aged patients. So it can be done. Um, the dog, you know, was it, were we nervous at first? Sure. But I was amazed at how well this dog did during anesthesia. So if they're geriatric, 75% of their life expectancy, you know, a geriatric Great Dane is probably about five, six years old. A geriatric Chihuahua is probably 10, 11 years old, you know, so depending on the breed or the species, <clears throat> and then dogs, the breed, that will vary. But they do have decreased uh, liver and kidney function. They tend to have more degenerative disorders like arthritis. Um, they usually don't handle stress well. They're getting older. They don't like to be away from home. Um, so they typically need less drug. And this is why typically clinics have protocols. Like, you know, I, I don't like weight ranges. Like every dog that's zero to 20 pounds get this much drug, 20 to 40 gets this much, because every animal should be treated individually with anesthesia. So if you have routine doses for patients for certain surgeries, you really need to try to decrease the doses in geriatrics because you can always give more. They generally need um, less drugs. Now, they tend to have a little prolonged recovery because again, potentially older organs. They also, if they're colder, need will take a little bit of time to warm up. Um, so you wanna, and remember for hypothermia, I've told you guys that um, their temperature drops in the first, 20 minutes of anesthesia the most rapidly. If you can keep them warm in the prep room and during induction, you're gonna have a much better chance of keeping them warm in surgery. Um, and people tend to sometimes induce on metal tables and don't really get them on a heating pad until they're in surgery. But if you can start in the prep room, use some towels, potentially have a heating pad, rice socks, um, whatever, warm IV fluids, you're going to be better. So you're going to want to be a little more aggressive with temperature control in these guys. Um, and just realize you're going to do blood work and they may have slightly elevated enzymes, but just be aware that we just tend to try to use less drugs. And for this test coming up, I want you to be familiar with just some key recommendations. The other thing I should put, it's not on this slide, we do not pull their water. Most clinics are trained to um, say no food or water after like 8 p.m. And they just say that for every patient. But if you have an old dog or especially an old cat for a dental, um, and they can be teetering on renal failure. Their access to water is sometimes the only thing that's helping their kidney function. And if you take it away, and then sometimes they don't drink a lot after surgery, they can go for a period of time with no water. So we do not take their water. They can have water up until they come to the clinic. Um, so I think if you're at a practice, we really need to start getting away from this no water. Food is a different situation. 
but uh, you know, all of our oncology patients, they could all have water. But again, our oncology patients mostly fit into this category and they were all older. So we were like, we don't want to deprive them of water. Um, do you have any questions?